Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. Thank you. There's always one. Um, now, who here is familiar with Bitcoin Script? Put your hand up, please. Okay. Who here is not? Okay, good. That's good. We've got some people. Okay. <laughs> Christian is lying. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, okay. Okay, um, I wrote this whole thing assuming that everyone knew Bitcoin Script, and then I went, oh, maybe they don't. So, in 12 seconds, I'm going to explain what, explain what Bitcoin Script is. So, you'll only be slightly lost for the rest of my talk. Okay, so Bitcoin Script is a simple stack based language. Every Bitcoin output has one attached. You give it a pile of stack elements, and then it's a little program. It contains opcodes to push things onto the stack, push things off the stack, add numbers, etc. right? You feed this program stack elements. If you feed it the right ones, it gives you the thumbs up and everything's good. If it fails or gives you the thumbs down, your transaction doesn't work, right? The most common script is simply to check a signature provided on the stack matches the transaction that we're spending. Okay, any questions? Good, okay. That with that out of the way, if I may, for the next 40 minutes, or perhaps we're down to 35 minutes, I would like to take you on a journey. If you don't want to go, that's cool. Uh, I suggest you just nap, because the next four days look to be pretty intense. But if you do travel with me, it's going to be a bit different, okay? I have the world's most boring slides. I, I didn't even use mid-journey once, right? Instead, the wonders that we're going to behold together will appear behind your own eyes. At best, I have some of the descriptions that I might have used to prompt images, but I'm cutting out the middleman and feeding them straight into your imagination. <laughs> okay. So let's begin. One of the original opcodes, uh, Bitcoin opcodes, was disabled in version 0.3.1 in 2010. There's the CVE number. Okay. It's recently been reproposed by many people, including Ethan Heilman, but with a 520 byte restriction. Now, this makes sense because you're not allowed to start with any stack elements greater than 520 bytes. So, if you cut op cat so it can't produce them, you're consistent. But it does feel limiting, right? The obvious problem with this is that if you don't restrict it, right? you end up with opcat, dup, opcat, et cetera, until your machine blows up, right? But you can fix the obvious problem here by having a total stack limit. You are allowed to have 1,520 byte stack elements, so let's just say you can have up to 1,000 stack elements, and the total number of bytes could be 520,000. Okay, so we fix that. But then you hit another problem. Let's look at this little script here. Op dup, op sha256, op drop. If you have four megabytes worth of this, you're basically duplicating the top entry, hashing it, and then throwing it away again and again and again. So while we've solved the memory problem with a total stack limit, that leaves this problem. So if you max out the stack in our proposal, you could do 260K because you dump it for a total of 520. And uh, on the left is what happens if you have a four meg script that does this with 520 byte. You can't even see a bump there, but there is one. It's a couple of seconds. If you have 260K, that is the image on the right, and you can see a full block of those takes 700 odd seconds. Um, this, is, this is what we call in engineering bad. Um, now, part of the problem is opt up, which makes a gratuitous copy, and you can fix that fairly trivially, um, but we get a little bit better, maybe? Um, you know, <laughs> but this is, this is still bad, okay. So, this is kind of similar to a problem we already have in Bitcoin, which is that check SIG operations are slow. And Taproot solves this with a SIG ops budget. You know, you basically get one op check SIG per 50 bytes of script, right? You go, you go over that, your script fails. You're doing something weird. So, obvious question. Can we do the same thing with a hashing budget? And the TapScript SIG ops budget works because it's generous enough that you don't have to worry about it, but low enough that it prevents you from dosing the network. Can we do the same thing here? Okay, well, this is the question. Let me show you another little script. Opt up, opt up, op equal verify. Duplicate it twice, check that it's equal. It should be, of course. You can also fill four megabytes of this, 
And actually, it's still pretty bad. There's no hashing in here anywhere. Okay, so it turns out that it is not just hashing. On modern CPUs, SHA-256 just isn't that slow. It's also hyper-optimizing Bitcoin because we use it everywhere. No, once you get restore larger stack elements, the question now becomes what's the worst case stack bytes actually touched by a reasonable implementation? Okay, so the budget cost should depend on the size. This leads us to what I call a VARops cost model, right? It turns out all our operations which work on a stack, because we're a stack machine, basically can be expressed as linear passes across that data. And that's sensible because that's how modern machines work. It's how caching works, right? If you cache something, your cache loves you when you access it nice and linearly, and all of them do that. And we can basically assume that that cost dominates, right? Um, we don't care if about actually resizing the stack itself. We don't really care about um, whether you're doing a read or a write or modify, that's all good. Um, we assume that we're using simple arrays and vectors, which we do currently. And we assume that anything you're doing with the things in your CPU is basically free, except for hashing. Okay, and this is important. You have to think about the worst case. How bad can it get? How much accesses do you need to do in the worst case of the data? If you do this, let's see what we get. Here's op verify. Op verify says, is this zero? Uh, if it is, fail. Okay, now, the cost of this, it has to look through the whole thing. I mean, it could be, Zero, 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 one, right? It might have to go 520K to find whether it's zero or not. So the cost is simply the length. Straightforward, 520K of reads. Opt up, a little bit different. You make a copy. Read, write, read, write, read, write. Operating length times two. Okay, so far our model looks good. Let's look at op equal. This one's a little bit weird. It's either free, because if the lengths are unequal, you don't even need to look at them. You go, they're not equal, I know that. Or it's the length, which is the, both of them, times two. So the cost isn't actually a linear function necessarily of your sizes. We can do this for every push up code. Uh, for push, you're kind of copying out of your data stream. So you can technically pay the cost to write it on the stack. Okay, that's fine. Everything else, you know, how much data did you copy? Twice that is your number. Okay, this is good. Verify again, equal verify, if up. You should note that there's no var ops table for op if and op not if, and that's because in Taproot, you, they have to be zero or one. You're not allowed to put 520K on the stack and say, is that true with op if or not if. Uh, but if duff, if dup doesn't have that. Okay, now, hashing. We talked about hashing. And for that, it's length times by some hash factor, right? So, because hashing is one of those cases where our assumption doesn't hold, you do actually spend some CPU churning through the data, so you can't just go memory bound. Um, and we see here this hash 256, which is hashing it twice, we don't care. That's an edge condition, right? Um, we care about really little big data, in which case doing one extra hashing is in the noise. Okay. And there are two old hash opcodes, RIPEMD160 and SHA-1. Nobody's gonna optimize those, I don't want them to have to do it. Um, so you just fail, if that's too big, you fail. Um, and you start to question your life choices if you ever hit that condition, because why are you doing that? Okay, now the hash factor I mentioned is to be derived later, um, and we'll see that in uh, a later slide. Okay, so we have our model, and this contains constraints, our worst case behavior. So, let's restore some opcodes now, okay? Let's start with the bitwise ones. Uh, op invert flips every bit, well, the cost is obviously the length, that's easy. Uh, op and is the sum of the two lengths, whereas op XOR is the double the minimum of the shortest one. With OR and XOR, you take, you, you presume that you're oper operating into your longer one, right? You're flipping the bits. You're, you XOR, and then if you run out of the short one, you just stop. With and, you've got to zero out everything else. So and is the sum of the two, and OR and XOR are slightly cheaper. Okay, cool. Now, opcat itself, remember where we started with me getting upset about opcat being limited? Well, let's look at it. If it simply allocates a new vector and copies them both in, it looks like this. The cost is obviously copying both of them twice the input length sum. But that is not how you implement opcat, right? Any programmer will tell you what you actually do is 
you resize in place and then copy, because you're hoping the resize in place is basically free. But that turns out to be the same cost. And the reason is, in the worst case, that reallocate in place will have to do a copy internally anyway. So it's the same number, right? Remember, you're always allowed to beat the model. You can do smart things in certain cases and, and completely outstrip the model. That is fantastic. You're doing really well. Faster is always better. But you can't make the worst case worse. Okay. Let's do the other string opcodes while we're here. Left and right. Um, left is easy. It's basically free. You do have to read the offset. Don't forget that. that the number of bits that you're supposed to, or number of bytes you're supposed to cut at, that could be 520k long, right? Because it just could have a whole heap of zeros in it. So you do have to read that. But once you've done that, you just chop. You don't touch any data at all. Write is a bit different. You have to move the data down to the front. By the way, left and right do exactly what you expect. They cut at certain points. You take the left part or you take the right part. OK, so write's a bit weird. Take the length, minus however much you said, whatever offset you said, and that's the amount. Um, technically, that's bottom to zero, but you'll figure that out. Substring is basically they tell how much to copy out of the middle. The cost is effectively the amount that they tell you to copy. Great, OK. Now we're going to get to two of my least favorite opcodes. L shift shifts a value to the right, and R shift shifts a value to the left. Thank you, little Endian. OK, so I have renamed these to upshift and downshift so we sound vaguely coherent, OK? Downshift has to just move some bits um, from the end to the start. So it's pretty straightforward. You basically go, how many, how many bytes are you actually moving? You've got to read the value. Uh, you've got to figure out how much you're moving. That's fine. Uh, upshift, however, upshift has two distinct cases. <sighs> and I'm still going back and forth whether we should split these. But you're either moving a whole number of bytes, which is easy. It's basically just a mem move. Just basically, but you allocate. You just shove stuff in the front. Or you have to allocate, shove stuff in the front, and then add one byte at the end and shift everything along which means another pass through. So it's four times the value. So that's kind of ugly, uh, and the names are terrible. Um, now, unlike the L shift and R shift, which was in 0.3.0, these versions do not trim the trailing zeros. Satoshi's implementation did. So they turned them into numbers, which is when they shift the zeros. They tr trim the trailing zeros, because trailing in the Lindian means the big ones, right? So instead of 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, you know, it's just one. We don't do that, because that's an interesting design choice for shifting. OK. OK. That did get ugly for a moment. But we're through. We have unshackled our stack limits. We've restored our opcodes. What else is there to do? Well, script is limited to signed 31-bit arithmetic. But we can have up to 51 bits of Satoshis, right? <laughs> I can't, uh, but uh, in theory, someone can. Um, actually, I'm quite happy with 31 bits of Satoshi if anyone wants to help me test. Um, but, and there are also other unsigned 32-bit fields that we'd like to deal with, right? Now, Blockstream's Elements has a whole suite of opcodes to do this, right? It has these 64-bit opcodes. It has conversions back and forth between the 31-bit script, script numbers we have today and those. Um, and every time, you, when you add or subtract values on the stack, you get two values. You get the value and a flag that says whether it succeeded or not, whether it overflowed, right? Now, this approach makes me a little bit skeptical. Uh, firstly, because it's ugly. You end up basically doing op verify after every single arithmetic operation. <sighs> but also because my first computer was 8-bit. Um, well, it was kind of like, it had, it had pretensions of being 16-bit, but really it was 8-bit in 16-bit pants. And then I went through a 32-bit transition, and then I went through a 64-bit transition. So I just have a feeling that I cannot guarantee you that 64 bits will be enough forever. And at this point, I'm looking at my var ops hammer and going, huh, what if we, what if add simply doesn't overflow? Right? Um, what if we just go, well, variable length integers, right? Uh, now, one of the problems with variable length integers is where do you put the sign bit? And the answer is don't. Everything is unsigned. And we should define all our arithmetic ops to 
normalized to truncate unnecessary zeros. If we do this, we end up with something that looks like this. Here's how much everything costs. Op negate and op abs are unused. We, it doesn't even make any sense anymore. We don't have signed things. Uh, so potentially two more op success op codes. Um, but every other comparison is pretty much exactly what you'd expect, right? This is straightforward. Okay. Well, that's cool. Um, subtraction is fun. We have no negative numbers, so it can fail. And I thought about doing this element style push the success flag, but I know you're just going to do op verify after it every single time. So let's just do that directly. You, you're not allowed to underflow. It fails. If you really want to do that, dup to do your comparison first, check, but you don't. So we do have to. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's the sum of the two lengths. You're basically subtracting everything. Worst case, you subtract something and you have to go all the way through because it, it underflows all the way through. But that's okay. This does assume that you subtract in place, by the way. You're not subtracting to a third thing because that's three passes, not two. But that's fine. Uh, yep. Now, but we do define it to normalize. Remember I said we might as well trim zeros. Arithmetic ops should trim zeros. That just makes perfect sense. Um, we do that today. But you can't do it in the naive way. You can't do the subtraction and then walk back through it to find how many zeros are and chop it off. Because that would be a third pass. And the model doesn't allow that. You only have two. But that's easy. What you do is you just track the zeros as you go. If you put a zero there last, you remember, and then you go, okay. Okay, that's fine. Add. Can we add? Yes. Well, it's just like subtract, except it can overflow. And if it overflows, worst case, you have to add a byte, which means you have to reallocate the whole thing, which means another copy, which costs you twice the length. So worst case, it's actually, it's basically four times. So it's twice as slow as add. But it works in the model. Okay. Here's our costs. We're all good. Okay, it's a lot of talk. Well, this is a good time to show you some actual benchmarks. Um, I had to actually implement this, right? To personally to test the model, but also to get a feel for what's performance like. You know, I've used 520 kilobyte opera, up codes, uh, operands, which I know I said that's the total stack limit, so actually you can't have two of those and add them together, but just bear with me for a moment. I wanted to compare apples to apples. Here is the implementation. Now this matters, right? The blue one on the left, uh, the columns on the left, are the naive, byte by byte, stupidest possible implementation you can have. We won't be doing that. The second, the middle column, is what happens if you have unaligned vectors. Nobody has unaligned vectors. Don't do that either. Um, but it's important to handle it if you have it. And then on the right, that kind of cream colored column, that is what the actual performance you get. This is on my laptop anyway. On the far end, I put SHA-256, remember our SHA-256 friend? That is doing a whole SHA on 520K, and it turns out that's about eight times as expensive as doing an invert. So that's where the number eight comes from. So that means that this would work on my laptop. Okay. All right. We've done that. Let's bring back some other opcodes. Opmo, let's multiply. It's basically a series of ads, right? Now, at this point, you go, how many ads? Well, the answer is how many, what's your bit width? Everyone is 64-bit these days, right? So I can just assume that. Um, you have a 64-bit multiply. Even ARM, even Raspberry Pis now have a 64-bit multiply in hardware because of Neon, right? So every machine you're likely to run on, every machine you can pretty much run Bitcoin on reasonably today can handle 64-bit multiply. So that's easy. You do that. Um, you can do better than this naive ad. There's Karatsuba, there's Tom Cook, there's FFTs, there's the whole thing. Um, but I do not assume that our implementation will do that. If somebody does, they'll beat the model and that is wonderful for them. Um, I looked at libgmt, GMP, it is so fast. It's unbelievably fast. But it has about eight to 12 different multiplication routines depending on which one, which sizes you're dealing with and we do not want to do that. Uh, I do, no, I do not want to do that. Somebody else can do it. Um, I have not done opdivide. It's kind of the final boss of um, variable length arithmetic, um, and it is on my to-do, I have. They will stay tuned for that. Okay, we've got our varops things now. We know a cost for every thing that we could do in script, and we've used it to free us from the shackles of small size limits, right? But we didn't actually discuss how much budget do I get? How much budget do I start with that I'm gonna take this from, right? How much varops budget do you get per byte? That is actually not a trivial question to answer, but we do allow 
80,000 objects per block, right? How long does that take? Well, on my laptop, it takes 4.92 seconds. And during that time, I could do about what, 35 gig of op inverts. And so, block for that, therefore, the answer is 8825, uh, right? So this is my penciled in number for that multiplication factor. For every byte, you will get 8825 8, varops budget to play with. Um, but when you think about it, you could waste, you could have your 80,000 check sigs wasting that much time, and then you could use up your entire varops budget and waste that much time as well. Again, doubling your block validation time, right? So really, it makes sense to combine this into one budget again and go, well, whatever you get for 50 bytes, you can do a check sig and we'll come out of the same budget, right? So we unify the budgets at that point. Now, this is important to look forward a little bit and presage later on in my talk. If we have introspection opcodes, okay, if we have more advanced introspection opcodes, certainly, then the budget should be per transaction because a script can ask about the other inputs or the other outputs. Um, and it's not your fault if you're a small script. What you care about is the size of the transaction. So the budget actually depends on your total transaction size, not your individual uh, witness weight, which is um, a change from the way that the SIGOP, the, the, the SIGOP budget works. Okay, oh, how would we transition? And I had to redo this slide yesterday because we had a discussion about this and, and everyone hated the way I transitioned. I added a new SegWit version, BT1Z, uh, but everyone went, you don't need to do that, Rusty. They suggested that they really want a 33-byte script pub key because they want the parity bit back because apparently it just makes life really hard to do 32-byte 32 32 uh, ex-only pub keys. So if they did that, we could say, okay, in that case, you're using new script. Um, because we want to reuse existing opcodes and change the number semantics, it would be awkward just to add a crap load of uh, new, new opcodes, add V, add sub V, sub 1V, all those. If we want to change opcode semantics, we really do need to update the script version, uh, to be tap script V2, um, internally at least. Uh, but we also want to avoid this dummy key penalty, right? So if you use taproot today and you only want a script, you put in a dummy pub key. And that seemed like a good idea at the time, except the problem is that every time you propose a new opcode, everyone who wants to use it goes, but I, it's gonna cost me 33 bytes, because now I have to use uh, Taproot, and there's no particularly good reason for that. So it would be nice to define it such that you can omit that. And there was a whole discussion yesterday on how we could do that. Uh, but basically, uh, you either have a raw um, Merkle sum in there, or you use a dummy. Um, Num's point. It also, frankly, makes writing the script interpreter a lot clearer. You go, if you're this, you use these versions, otherwise this. So that's nice. Okay. At this point in our journey, we have climbed mountains, you know, crossed rivers, battled dragons, well, cats, cats. We, we've, we, we, we battled cats. They've got claws, that's like a, okay, imagination. We have battled dragons, let's stick with that. We seem to have a way to place reasonable limits on the 51 opcodes that deal with variable length stuff in script. Many of the restored ones, in a way that doesn't actually seem too onerous, right? It's pretty compatible with stuff that we do already. So at this point, I wanna look briefly into the future. Okay. Da, 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 there we go. Um, <laughs> why did I not just break this up? Okay. It's worth noting, opcat by itself, and certainly the other opcodes, give us covenants badly. Right? <laughs> right? We've got them badly. And now we can handle values nicely. We can actually deal with 64-bit values in the same way and everything else. It seems obvious that let's just give ourselves direct introspection. Let's just ask, what is the value of this? But I want to make a very good point here that that is not sufficient. And I will give you a thought, like kind of a, a thought experiment 
on why you can't just live with Varops Uber Alice. Okay, it's not all we need. Let's take a look at the great granddaddy OG introspection op code called op checksig. Or to give it its scientific name, op select TX parts from flags, SHA-256, and checksig, right? Now imagine you're like a var ops maximalist, and you're like, you know what? We can deconstruct this and have a script that looks something like this. You know, it gives us the bits of the transactions, and uh, we, then we share it ourselves. We hash it ourselves, and then we op checksig from stack. It's the stupidest name ever. Of course, from stack or a stack machine, everything's from stack. But you know, just to differentiate from the the other one. Okay, so we could have a four megabyte transaction. It could have containing this script about 38,000 inputs, each of which would try to hash the entire transaction. The cost, according to our cost model of that, is about 35 times the budget that we have. Right? Each input is hashing the entire transaction, four megabytes, over and over and over again. Right? So obviously, you can see from this, that that is grossly inefficient and exceeds our budget, even though our budget is incredibly generous, right? which is another way of saying the same thing, it's too slow. And it's stupid, they're all doing exactly the same hashing. We need some kind of introspection which gives us a cached hash, a cached hash that has been calculated once for the entire transaction and things like that. We need this to make this work. You can't just use varops. Okay, now Bitcoin has changed a bit since 2010, you may have noticed, but two things particularly stand out. We've added taproot trees and we've added op success. Op success is fantastic because it's mere presence in a script. Just being there makes the script succeed. And taproot trees allows you to specify a number of conditions and meet only one of them. Fantastic. But this presents a problem for introspection. You see, if you wanna say this script, I don't care what it does, but it has to test condition X. Or it has to be a 20 block delay or whatever else, and then whatever else you want. You can't do this, you see, you can't use separate taproot leaves because they provide an or. You want an and. You want to say this condition and something else. And you can't do the obvious thing of going, well, as long as your script starts with 16 op um, CLTV, then I'm happy because they can stick an op success later on and the whole thing will succeed without running that at all. So one way of solving this is to produce something like an op code like op segment. It does exactly what it sounds. You scan the script, you divide it up along the op segment divisors, and you treat each section of the script separately. You look through the first section, you go, it has no op success in it. You evaluate that. You look for the second one, you go, oh, it has an op success, we succeed. Or it doesn't, and we evaluate it, right? This effectively prevents an op success override in a certain subset, and um, allows you to do this and condition and say, the script must do this, okay. Cool. Obviously also, because of the way taproot trees work, you effectively, in order to prove the root, you will need to be able to tweak. Um, uh, do an operation where you take a key and you tweak, a, tweak it with a value. Um, that's one of the fundaments that we require. Uh, the minimum thing would be to implement that as an opcode. It's actually surprisingly slow. Um, it's, it's not, not quite as bad as a signature check, but it's, it's slower than I expected. Um, and because taproot trees are sorted lexicographically, that turns out to be exactly the opposite of what we do because we're a little Indian. So you do need some way of doing a, a bit 341 style compare. The best way I can think of to do that is have a byte reverse that switches your Indian. So you can switch the Indian to the two of them and do a compare like normal. Um, we could change that, but we were not going to. And of course, while you're here, let's get op check sig from stack. I want to call op check sig and rename op check sig, but that's probably a stretch too far. Um, but it's, it is trivial to implement and very easy. Um, and it de does deconstruct strip a little bit. Okay, now let's go further in the future. What else could we want? If we want script to be this grown up cat that does everything we could ever want, what else do you want? You want iteration. No, not that kind, you actually just want. What you want is an op each input and an op each output. You want to be able to say, I only want to do this for every input or I want to do this for every output. It's very natural, it's very constrained. Um, 
It pushes the input number on the stack, runs up until the next op end if. You probably want op break and op continue. What's interesting is, you can pre-process this, right? You can say, oh, I can turn the, I can expand this out. Because at the time you're looking at the script, you know how many inputs and outputs there are. So you can actually just expand it out into a bigger script that has this cut and paste over and over again. It does mean weirdly that the weight of the script now depends on the number of inputs and outputs, which is just odd. Uh, but it does work in some way. And I am only suggesting this because even the mental model of this existing proves to be useful. So even if we never actually implement op each input and op each output, they turn out to be very powerful tools to evaluate other things, and we'll see that in a moment. Okay, now. I don't know if you're paying attention, but fees are going to go up. That, that was actually a controversial statement a number of years ago, but now it's widely accepted. Um, what does that mean? Well, it has a whole heap of side effects. Um, and it has side effects on the design of scripting, interestingly enough, because people will do an obscene amount of engineering in the future to avoid paying fees, because it will be worthwhile. Okay. Every multi-party uh, scheme that I'm aware of involves basically holding a transaction from your counterparty ready to go should things mess up and going on chain. And holding it for a significant length of time, potentially. That means that you don't know what fees are gonna be. You really wanna add fees later. And the way everyone does this is child pays for parent. They just throw another transaction in, right? Now, the problem with that is, remember, fees are going to be expensive. And there's certainly a strong argument to suggest that the way you'll get around that is directly paying a miner because you don't want to pay a whole nother transaction, but directly paying a miner is a genuine centralization force because you will pay the biggest miner you can find. So the bigger miners will be more profitable, right? And it doesn't matter actually whether you're doing that through a CPFP or you're just adding fee inputs and outputs later. They're still expensive. Fees are expensive. You're gonna look at it any way you can to reduce them. And that, if that drives centralization, so be it. You won't care because your transaction will get in, okay. However, if a transaction can have these bundles, then in theory, you could take a whole pile of these transactions, stack them together, and add a single fee to the whole lot, and amortize the cost of this fee. How would you do this? Well, I have one design, uh, which you could certainly put holes in. Uh, you would basically, at the end of your sub-transaction, you would mark it end of inputs and end of outputs. You'd put something in somewhere. Um, if we have 33 bit script pub keys, you get a few spare bits. You could chuck one in to say this is the end of my little stack. And of course, this would alter the semantics of iteration, check sig, and introspection. They would all behave as if you were the only thing in the universe. Your sub-stack, your little sub-transaction was the whole thing. So those all just work like normal. And of course, if there's no end marker, that means your, your group is the entire transaction. So that's where you stick the fees at the end. All right, that would kind of work. So basically, you could have someone out there who you throw some sats at, throw them in your transaction, they just stack them all together and they attach a fee output. Um, and anyone could do this. Yes, it is trusted, but it doesn't have to be a miner doing this. Anyone could throw transactions together for you, take a fee. And it's kind of a recurring service too, so there is some reputation that would work in this case. And of course, if all else fails, you just do it yourself. Your stack of one, you add your fee, but that's obviously something you don't want to do all the time. But there's another really interesting idea which competes with us, uh, which came out recently, so I've put it on here. And that is this idea of the Ruben Merch neighbor sponsorship, where the transaction can say, I am only valid if I immediately follow this other transaction, right? Which is kind of like a, and you can do that pretty cheaply. And if you could do that for several hundred, rather than stacking transactions, you would just turn them into this road train of transactions and right at the end, you would have your sponsor that's paying for everything else. <sighs> we had this, we went around way too long yesterday on this. Um, you do, it does end up costing you about 40 more weight per sub transaction to do sponsorship. It's slightly more efficient to do stacking but you could also argue it's more work to do stacking. So I'm leaving this one open. 
just wanted to make sure everybody knew that we were going to have to do something along these lines um, so that we can handle the fee issue. Okay, there's a whole pile of bike sheds to paint and to do's. Um, I said the total stack limit, 520K is obvious because it doesn't change anything. But f I can't find anyone who knows, does anyone know why the limit is currently 520 bytes per stack element? Yeah, why 520? Right, yeah. <laughs> oh. Right. Okay. That's the best one. That, that's better than the 8 byte prefix on a 512 byte. Pile of poop. Okay, uh, I'm going to go with that one. Um, RSA. So, so, so Andrew Polstra uh, suggested that there's a hypothesized reason that it's, you can fit an RSA signature in there, which is true, um, and that in some pre-Bitcoin they could have used RSA, and hence that you can see the bones of that design carried through in the 520 byte limit. Um, the truth is nobody truthfully knows why 520 bytes, so it's kind of arbitrary. And arbitrary limits are annoying. Since we have a SIG ops budget, or we have an ops budget now, we could unleash that a bit. And we could say, well, a transaction can be up to four megabytes. You can have four megabytes on the stack. It means you can drop a whole transaction on the stack. You should probably add a little bit more so you've got a few other things. But, you know, four genuine megabytes, not four million bytes, uh, would be a reasonable stack limit. It does increase the runtime requirements of your Bitcoin node, but nobody cares. Like, four megabytes is not going to cut the difference, right? So, we could certainly have that, that, that um, that debate. Um, wider benchmarks, right? My laptop's not a canonical thing to use. We do need a broad range of benchmarks to establish relative costs uh, across a whole heap of different machines. Um, I've got to implement opdiv. Um, we do need a full script implementation, right? We actually need not just enough for me to benchmark. I tended to mug opnop4 for different things so I could benchmark it. You actually need to write the code and do it properly. And then you're like, well, what other changes, right? What introspection opcode? I said we should have one. It'd be nice to have one. We need to be able to see inside our things properly because we can do it badly, so let's do it well. You know, but there's a whole question of like, while we're here, what else should we do? That is a whole thing that basically is the next four days of talks. What other things could we do? Um, and I only have 45 minutes. So we're almost at the end. <sighs> Summary. So, when I suggested that I hated 64-bit arithmetic, well, that, that rather than 64-bit arithmetic, we should go for variable length arithmetic, Anthony Towns pointed out to me that actually, this is a return to Bitcoin 0.3.0. I hadn't realized, I knew all the opcodes had been thrown away, but I didn't realize that originally we had variable length integers in Bitcoin. More broadly, the script system that we ended up with after the emergency response to the CBE when everything was on fire is, is like this strange, awkward thing, right? Not, not the programmable money that we all envisaged. But a full restoration of script does more than bring back something that we lost. It lets us evaluate ideas. Iteration, segmentation, these are ideas that came around because people wanted to make vaults. Right? And new ideas are much more powerful and concrete and, and able to be assessed and evaluated when you can express them in script itself. And then if the new idea is useful and you can't do it in script, why can't script do it? Why don't we fix script? So, and finally, script being its full self lets us evaluate future optimizations, right? We can see how much it would improve based on real usage, right? And don't, don't worry, there's still gonna be plenty of things we can argue about. But if someone proposes a new opcode, even if you would never use it, you can see how much it would optimize on-chain usage that other people are doing and leave more room in blocks for stuff that you do wanna do, right? And in the extreme case, we can even consider new, script, new key types. If there's some script that everyone's using, we can go, cool, let's just make that a new key type and it expands internally to that script, right? 
in the next four days, you're going to hear some amazing ideas. And I've spent my entire 30-year programming career building tools for other developers to build things that I can hardly imagine. And sometimes they've been stupid, and sometimes they've even been evil, but the vast majority of them are brilliant and fantastic. And I can't consider that we would want to do anything short of giving them the best possible tools that we can build. Now, we need to put in the work, and it needs to be thoughtful, and it needs to be thorough, and it needs to be methodical. But nothing here is novel or even conceptually complex. It's just engineering. And we've done much harder things in Bitcoin already. Now, if my own children should take an interest in Bitcoin one day, I hope they get to control their own money. And I want doing that to be as natural and expressive as it can be. And if you feel the same way, I hope you'll continue this journey with me. Thank you.